today. Hopefully your uh, stomachs are not quite as full as the last few days as mine was, so I'm, I'm very thankful for all the blessings that we have here. Thankful to, for each one of you who are here this morning who have chosen to spend time worshiping God with us. Especially thankful for our visitors. I know there's people I haven't seen before, and so you're our honored guest. If you do have a chance, if you would, fill out one of the guest cards in front of you and uh, put that in the offering basket on your way out. We'd really appreciate it just so we can acknowledge your visit. Thank you to all the regular members. Thank you to those who are joining online as well. If you would please stand as we uh, sing our next songs. I have two songs and then the opening prayer. I am a poor wayfaring stranger while traveling through Mystery in oceans deep, my 
to us and blessed us with in this life and in, in, uh, in our service to you. Father, as a, as, as a nation this past week, we took time to do just that, to stop and, and think about what we have in this life, Lord, and most and all of it comes from you. And Lord, we thank you for this country that we live in and the freedoms that we're able to enjoy, the prosperity that we have, Lord, but most of all, we thank you so much for the ability that we have to come together to worship you and to follow you in our lives. And most especially of all, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your son, the sacrifice that he offered that allows us to even have a relationship with you and the ability to commune with you as we are right now in prayer and to know that you have given us your word and we can look into it to find out what your will is for us so that one day, we can not only be with you in spirit, but we can be with you in truth to spend eternity. Father, we, we know that in, in times past, we read about how powerful your hand is. 
And we all need your hand in our lives, and we pray for that, Lord. Some of our number come to us, come to mind at the moment. We want to remember them to you at this time. We remember Rose Morris's brother, Tommy. We remember the McConaughey and the Howell family and their recent loss. Carla and her ongoing struggles. Anthony and Teresa and Trey, who are all recovering from recent procedures, Lord. And those are just a few. There are so many who continue to need your prayer, your, your helping hand in their lives, Lord. We can read about the incredible things that your hand has done throughout all time. We know that all things are, are possible with you, Lord, and we pray for them that you would do so. Father, as we just sang, we pray that you would help us to keep our eyes above the waves of this life. Living in this world, with this life, Lord, there are always ongoing struggles. But help us, Lord, to do just that, to keep our eyes above what's happening, fixed on you, for you have never failed and you never will fail, Lord. Help us to find comfort and solace to in that as we live through this life with that incredible hope that we have of being with you. Father, we pray that you will be with us through the rest of this service, that everything that we do here today is in accordance with your will, that it is pleasing to you with what we do. And Father, also that it is encouraging and edifying to us and it builds us up in our spiritual lives so that we can live stronger lives in your service, not only for ourselves, but also to be an encouragement and a light to those who are around us. Please, as we leave here, Lord, help us to take you with us in all that we do and all that we say. And again, Lord, we thank you so very much for the gift of your Son and his sacrifice. And it is in his incredible name, Jesus, who is your Son and our Savior, the Christ, that we offer this prayer. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Next, we're going to sing a medley of songs leading our minds uh, to the Lord's Supper, remembering our Savior, as Derek mentioned, beginning with Days of Elijah, and we're going to end, uh, at the end of the medley, there'll be other songs that we're going to end with a new song, Calvary. So, these are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sorrow, in the desert, crying, prepare me the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, so lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes to God.
grace to trust Him more. Holy Lord, most holy Lord, You alone are worthy of my praise. Oh, holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing. With my heart I sing. Of all the assignments given to the men of this congregation that I volunteered for, this is the one that I've had the most hesitation about. And when I say hesitation, I mean it in the sense of fear, respect, and the desire to do an appropriate job of relaying the true weight and meaning of this act of communion that we do each week. I think any, anyone would agree that it's human nature that we often become desensitized to anything that we do repeatedly. Yet as Christians, we must have the proper discipline and respect, focus, and relationship with our Lord and Savior to appreciate the magnitude of this communion that we participate in each week. And to put it simply, had it not been for Jesus' humble willingness to be mocked, spat upon, tortured, and ultimately killed for our own sake, there would be no Christianity. There would be no salvation, and there would be no hope of eternal life with our Father in heaven. And as we partake of this communion, I hope that we can do so with that in our hearts and our, in our minds. Shall we pray? Lord, as we come before you to partake of this bread, which represents your son's body, which was so brutally beaten and mocked and spat upon, and ultimately killed for our sake. May we partake of it in a manner that is well-pleasing in your sight. 
in one of full appreciation of the sins that it bore on our own individual sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray for the cup? Lord, as we come before you to partake the fruit of the vine, which represents your son's blood, which was shed, for the remission of sins of all of mankind throughout all time, may we recognize, as we spoke of this morning in class, that it's for the remission of our own, our own sin, Lord, our sins that oftentimes only we know but we know that you know those sins, Lord. And we know that Jesus knew those sins, and yet he laid down his life and shed his blood to act as a mediator to atone for that, that debt to you, Lord, so that we could have hope of a salvation and life everlasting with you. As we take the fruit of the vine, may we do so in a manner well-pleasing in your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Aside from the uh, Lord's Supper, we've set aside this time to uh, give an offering back to support the work. There's a basket in the back that you can give uh, by traditional means. There's an app online that also is convenient for giving. Just point, shall we pray? Lord, as we come before you this morning to give back a portion of which we've been blessed to support your work, we ask that we do so with a cheerful and giving heart. As we learned from the widow with just two mites, Lord, we, we know that our heart and our mindset and our faith towards you are every bit as important as we give as any penny that we put into the, to the collection, Lord. We ask that you be with the leadership of this church, that they use the contributions in a manner well pleasing in your sight to support your work. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jared's lesson this morning is on grace. So we uh, sing about some of the grace of Jesus. If you would please be standing for this <laughs> song before the sermon this morning. <coughs> Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall the trace begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit Than 
the scope of my transgression. Pray your pardon, all my sin and shame. seeing you guys, there's quite a crowd, uh, so it's really great to, to be able to worship with you this morning. I want to welcome again all our visitors. I know it's kind of a holiday weekend, um, and uh, so I hope you've been uplifted and encouraged by being here today, and that we've hopefully um, you know, made it easy for you to worship God together. Uh, Kenny and Dewey are traveling for Thanksgiving, so uh, you're stuck with me again, um, and i uh, but the elders asked if I could cover, and I'm, I'm always grateful to, to have another opportunity to speak. So I hope you'll follow along in your Bible with me uh, this morning. So let me uh, first start by just asking you some questions. Um, if, your, if your mom, let's say, gave you a, a $5 bill, uh, what would your response be? You'd probably say, oh, oh yeah, thanks, that, that should come in handy. You know, maybe for <laughs> bottle of water, a candy bar, or something, you know. Um, what if your grandma gave you a $50 bill and a really nice card? You'd probably say, uh, you know, oh, now we're getting somewhere. Now it's, it's uh, you know, wow, this is this is really too much. You're, you're such a sweet, you know, grandma or whatever, you know, just very appreciative. Um, now, how about this? What if a, what if a complete stranger found out uh, that you were renting a studio apartment, let's say in, I don't know, San Diego, and paying, paying an egregious amount of money in rent, and, uh, and he decided to give you his $5 million home, bought and paid for. What would your response be? You'd be beside yourself, right? You'd be absolutely floored. Um, but nothing could compare to that extreme change in quality of life and, and those kinds of things. But what would your response be? So that's what I, that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. Um, <coughs> James spoiled it for me, about the grace of God. Um, because I want to talk about what our response would be given that we are given the greatest gift in all of creation, and that is the grace of God. Correct. So grace is kind of sometimes a topic that's a little bit shied away from in the conservative church um, because, you know, we often want to be so careful, so, so cautious that we're not giving the wrong impression of what we mean when we say grace. 
that we don't want to give this this impression of that it's faith alone or that you know you just have to believe and that's literally all you have to do but i think in that effort of avoiding that teaching we sometimes neglect um you know how foundational and how wonderful uh, grace is and how foundational it is to what it means to be a christian in general um, and when we, when we neglect that, when we neglect the teaching of grace, we neglect one of the most beautiful parts of God's, uh, God's word for us. So with our time today, I just want to explore this topic a little bit with you, uh, the topic of grace, and see if we can gain a greater appreciation for and, and understanding of what grace uh, should mean for us and what that should do for us. Um, and especially I thought it fit in light of our uh, Thanksgiving holiday. So. so first off, when we talk about grace, what do we mean? What, what exactly is grace when we, when we talk about that? You know, grace in kind of a worldly sense has, has many definitions. Um, it, can, it can refer to elegance or regality. You know, if you were to, to meet the queen, you would say, your grace, you know, something like that. Um, we use graceful to describe someone who's charitable or beautiful or things like that. We could say, you know, we could tease someone and say, oh, you've graced us with your presence today. Um, there's so many ways that it, that it fits. Um, but in a biblical sense, it encompasses all of that and more, except, except for maybe the teasing part. But, um, but it encompasses all of those ideas. Um, so for our purposes this morning, biblical grace, I'm going to call it, is just in simple terms, the gift of God to man, the gift from God to man. Um, it's, it's this gift that he extends to his creation and particularly to mankind. Um, and we'll, we'll explore that more in a minute. But the grace of God is, is exactly that. It's, it's a gift. Um, it's, uh, you know, a gift is, is not bought or earned by the person that you're giving it to. It's, you know, you, you give someone a gift. Why? Like, why, why do you give someone a gift? It's, it's because you love them, because you want them to be happy, um, because you know that maybe they need it or they want it, uh, something that they've been longing for. And it's the same way with God. You know, he, he gives us his grace, not because we deserve it or because we've earned it in any way, but because we're his children and because he loves us, um, because he wants to give us something that we need. Um, now, there are obviously some other implications of what God's grace means for us, what it should cause us to do that we'll get into shortly. But, but for now, I just want to focus it right there about the gift, the magnitude of this thing that he's given us. Um, so to help us answer this question of, of what is grace, I want to refer to Romans chapter 5. If you'd like to turn there with me in the Bible. Um, I really think this is one of the best passages to, uh, to describe what grace is um, and to explain what it is. It goes into such great detail about what it, exactly it is that God gave us uh, when we talk about the grace of God. Um, so let's start with Romans chapter 5. I'll just read the first two verses here to start out. Paul here says, Therefore, since we, have been, uh, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So here Paul begins with, therefore, and meaning there's there's a context behind everything that he's that he's about to share with us. Um, the context here, without without really getting too deep into it, is uh, if you flip back flip back to Romans chapter four and skim through it, he's talking about the faith of Abraham. He's talking about Abraham's faith back in those days, and he develops this idea that Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness, is what he says meaning that his, his trust in God, his faith, um, is what saved him, not, not his adherence to any law. And that's kind of obvious because the law of Moses hadn't been written yet, so he had nothing to adhere to. 
so he was kind of making that argument that um, you know it's, it's his faith that saved him. And so based on that, now back to chapter 5 in these verses, Paul is drawing this comparison between the faith of Abraham, and that he was justified by that faith, to the way that we are justified by our faith in Christ. Um, and he says, based on that, that we have peace with God through Christ Jesus. And there's the gift. There's, there's the grace. It's the peace of God that we get. And kind of let, let that soak in with you for a moment about what that means to you. That we have peace with God. If you really kind of feel that and let that affect you, that should give us this sense of like, ah, you know, finally, finally I have what I've been looking for. Um, you know, I found what I've needed. It's that feeling that we all search, search for when we start craving the relief from our worldly, sinful lives that only God can offer. Um, only God can give it to us. And not only that, but he tells us exactly how God did it as well. Um, he touched on it here in verses 1 and 2, but then as I've shown there, verses 6 through 11, I'll read that now. Uh, he says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if we will for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So here it's, it's Jesus who brought reconciliation. It's, it's him who... Uh, you know, that, that, re that reconciliation, meaning that our relationship with God has been restored. What, what was once lost so long ago in the garden is now brought back. It's this peace that God has been searching for, he's been longing for with us. And we've been longing for it too. We want to be right with God. We don't want to feel, you know, like there's something missing in our life. We're searching, we're longing for it. But these, these, uh, this gift of peace here was given to us by the sacrificial death of Christ. You know, we'll, we'll see later in Romans, in uh, chapter 6 and verse 23, that sin has a price. It has a cost associated with it. And we've all sinned. Um, when we sin, the price that we pay is death. And that verse just says the wages of sin is death. And without paying that price, we have no peace with God. So that's why this is so important and so foundational. Um, these verses tell us that Jesus is the one that paid that price. He died so that all of us wouldn't have to. And not only that, he did it while we were enemies with him. He did it while you know, we were hating him. We were still, we were still racking up our debt. We were still you know, charging more and more and more to our name. Um, but he gave himself up anyway. So Christ, just like we, we talked about in the Lord's Supper, um, making such a great job, as he, he chose to die this gruesome, brutal death, knowing full well that you personally would sin again not too long after. Um, and that's, that is the gift. That is the grace of God. How amazing is that? How, how beautiful is that? Uh, that he, he created this plan for us and he laid all this down. But, so taking that all into account, what does that mean for us? You know, all, all of that transpired, this is this beautiful, amazing thing. So what, you know, what does that mean for us? Um, does, that, does that mean that I don't have to do anything? Does that mean that uh, I just, I'm going to get this gift and, 
we'll be, you know, I'm, I'm solid. Um, no, Paul, Paul answers that very question in the next chapter. Um, if you want to turn to Romans chapter 6, uh, just the first four verses I'll read here, where Paul covers this exact thing. <clears throat> he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you know, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So he says, you know, oh, so does that mean that you'll just save me and I'm, and I'm good to go? You know, there's nothing else that I need to do? And he says, no, of course not. That's, that's ridiculous. Um, those who have been, have, baptized, have been baptized with him have been buried with him. And there's this sense of, you know, there's something that's dead in the ground that's no longer needed anymore. You know, you're not going to go and, and dig up this, this uh, dead guy to start carrying it back around with you after, after you put it away. Um, but I want to take it just one step further about this question of, you know, what do I have to do? That's really what I, what I want to get to and sort of the meat of this is addressing this question, because I think it's a common sentiment among a lot of religious people, some religious people. Whether intentionally or not, there's this sense in, in which some people tend to ask, you know, what, what's the bare minimum that I have to do? What, what exactly is required of me to be saved, to get into the kingdom? Um, and, you know, guys, I, I hope that's not the state of your heart. But if, but if it is, how sad, how tragic that is. If you're really asking God, what's, what's the bare minimum required of me? Um, what's the state of your heart? Um, because if that's the way that we feel or the way that we think, we've lost sight of the goal. We've lost sight of, of what's truly important, of how much we've been given. Because it's only through that lens of your sin that you begin to realize just how much God did for you and continues to do for you. To illustrate that, I want to, I want to read a little bit more in Ephesians chapter 2. If you'd like to turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Paul, again, here writing, says, And you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Verse 4, But God... Being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not, a result, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So here Paul, writing again, writing again, says, You used to be so riddled with darkness and, and sin and death, in the depths of darkness, that you, know, you were dead. There was no life left in you. And I know we've, we've all reached that point, or we will reach that point at some, at some time of, of recognizing that. that there's, in, the, in our current state, there's no life. There's no hope for us in this, in this, uh, in this state of sin. You know, and we all used to be there, which is, I think, it is, as an important thing to point out. We all used to follow the passions of our, of our own flesh, of our own mind. 
Um, we all just kind of did whatever we wanted without a care in the world. But then in contrast to that, in verse 4, he says, but God. Um, and then look at how beautifully kind of descriptive Paul is about what he says about God. He says he's rich in mercy. He says his, his great love has covered us. And then my favorite one is the immeasurable riches of his grace. How cool is that? That's, that's just very impactful. But does that sound like someone who's only interested in doing a bare minimum? Does that sound like someone that asks, what, you know, what, where exactly do we draw the line about what I, what I have to do? You know? No, of course not. It's, we see this man here, you know, and it's, it's especially impactful when you think about who Paul was. If you read in, in his other writings and things, you see that he's this man who is, he calls himself the chief of all sinners. He's, you know, he, he used to literally abuse and imprison and see to the murder of Christians. Um, I don't think it gets much worse than that. <laughs> But instead, we, we see here this man remembering his darkest days, his, his most you know, uh, depraved state. But then verse 4, he says, but God did this. And he's so enthralled with the mercy and the grace of God that he can't help but pour out his heart for him. He can't help but give his life to God. And it's because he remembers how dark his life used to be. That's because he remembers how far he's come with God. <laughs> and so then when God asks him to, you know, or when he asks you and me to, to believe in him and to confess his name and anything like that, he say, uh, we say, yes, of course, Lord. Or if he asks you to be baptized to wash away your sins, you say, yes, Lord, of course I will. Or when he asks you to care for the needy or love your brothers and sisters in the church or things like that, you say, yes, Lord, what, what, else, what else can I do? What else can I serve with? Anything, what, anything he asks in light of your past sins, you're ready and willing to do because you've fallen in love with him and everything that he's, everything that he's given. And it's just like a husband and wife kind of relationship, which interestingly enough, is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. You know, uh, when your spouse asks you to do something, do you do it because you have to? Or do you do it while I hope not? Yeah. <laughs> There's some murmurings there. <laughs> or do you do it because you love them? And you just want, to, want another opportunity to, to show them that, how much you love them. I hope that's the case. I hope we at least strive for that, to have a good attitude about that. But, guys, if you get nothing else from this sermon, just get this. Remember the grace of God. Remember how far you've come and how much God did for you personally. Remember all of your darkest days, your sinful times. Remember all the horrible things that you used to do that God <coughs> brought you out of. Because... That is what will make us fall in love with God over and over again. That's what's going to light a fire under us to do what he says and more. To, um, to seek ways and seek opportunities to serve others and to serve him in however we can. If we keep that in the forefront of our minds, nothing that the Lord asks will be too hard or too big a task or too, you know, too scary of a, of, a, of a thing to do um, if we keep that in our minds. And we'll never say, what do I have to do again? Instead, we'll say, how much more can I give? How else can I serve my brothers and sisters? Here I am, Lord, send me. Thank you for your kind attention this morning. Um, I hope that you've learned something, and you've been stirred up, you've been encouraged. If you're not a child of God, you don't have access to that grace yet. Um, you haven't been given this peace that comes from being with God. 
But you have that opportunity again today. As long as you draw breath, you have that opportunity to, to turn to him from your, from your depths of, of darkness and, and experience the love that he offers. And we can help you do that. I want to leave you with one final passage because I think it sums up everything that we've talked about so well. Um, if you want to read with me, it's in Psalm 103. <laughs> Psalm 103, and I'll just read verses 8 through 19. It says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it's gone and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant, and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Let's stand and sing together. <laughs> <clears throat> Here I labor and toil as I look for a home, just a
Thank you, Jaron, for that message. We all need a little grace. We all need a lot of grace. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for helping us just for being reminded of that and the importance of how we are, what we are in God's life. Okay, so if you get a chance, make sure you get one of the bulletins that we have today. Some different news, some new news in it. December's coming up pretty quick. And the assignment list is already there. So check the assignment list. Make sure, you know, a lot of you are all traveling. A lot of us are all traveling and doing things. So we want to make sure if there's any gaps that need to be covered on the assignments, get with Bob or Bill, and they'll help you work on that. Also on the back of the bulletin, as you know, we support preachers and other parts of the world, and there's just a short message from one of our evangelists that we support. His name is Silas Silence Chiramba, but he's not silent. <laughs> as you can see by the back, through your benevolence, through the things you give, he's been able to do a lot of work, and just a short while ago, he had five baptisms. So we know that the power of God and the power of his message does touch a lot of hearts, and He's working in South Africa doing that. Okay, another message. You know, about three seconds after we say amen for the closing prayer, you start hearing the kids strategize how they're going to play and run around this place, right? But you need to put out a little message to the young ladies, the young girls. Part of that play can't involve locking the stalls in the women's bathroom. <laughs> As they get older, they'll understand that. But <laughs> so if you've got little girls and they're playing around, just remind them, don't lock the stalls in the bathroom. Not a good thing. Okay? All right, and some good news. We have some folks placing membership with us today. And they are Robert and Shirley Lucas, and then their daughter, Debbie are placing membership with us today. They've been here for a few weeks and they're here today. So I'm gonna ask them to stand if you can so everyone can see you. Welcome to the family. And then in addition to that, uh, Robert would like the prayers of the congregation because he is going through some serious health issues he just wants us to remember him in prayer. As we all know, those health issues can come to any of us at any time as well. So continue to pray that he can work, him and his family can work through those issues and, and help Robert out. Okay, I think that's all I've got for today. If there isn't anything else, please stand and we'll have our closing prayer. <coughs> together our beautiful loving heavenly father we thank you dear lord for the peace of this morning the opportunity we've had to gather here and lift praises to your name lord you are beautiful you are wise you are powerful you are truly graceful Lord, you are worthy of all praise. And Father, we thank you so much for your precious word that gives us encouragement and direction and instruction on how to live this life. And Lord, this morning we want to thank you for the message that we heard from your word about your grace. And we thank you so much for pouring it out on us when we are truly unworthy. It's your love and, and deep compassion for us. It's evidenced on the cross. Down to this very moment in which you let us draw breath. 
So we return that breath to you with praise and thankfulness, Father. And we ask that you go with us this week to be courageous and to be lights in our community, lights in our home, lights at work, We may walk and talk and behave as your children in this world of darkness, dear Lord. That we may bring encouragement and hope to those who are seeking it. Father, go with us. Keep us in your care always. We love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.